Testing, testing, mic check, one, two, three. Awesome. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Nicole Newlist, Rogue Clown, Hey Blue. I answer to just about anything, seriously. Um, so anyway, I'm here to talk a little bit about Capture the Flag. Um, the Capture the Flag, they're actually having one here at B-Sides Detroit, and it's starting in about half an hour, you know, surprisingly enough, contemporaneous with the end of this talk. And if you've done 80 bajillion Capture the Flags, maybe this isn't quite the talk for you, but if you've never done a capture of the flag, if you've done one or two and not quite sure about having your feet under you on them yet, if you're interested in learning more, if you don't know what a capture of the flag even is, then this is totally the talk for you and I suggest you stay. Um, it's only half an hour. I promise not to be too scary. Thank you. And you know, th this title says it all. If you, can, if you can open the terminal, you can, in fact, capture the flag. Now, what do you really need to do capture the flag? First of all, you need creativity. I've said this before, I'll say it again, I'll probably say it five times during the course of this talk. People who design capture the flags, who design these challenges, are devious. You know, they are security nerds like you or me or a lot of people here. And, you know, when writing these challenges, they're not just necessarily going to be like, oh, you know, Let's just put MSO 8067 on here. Everyone's going to pop it, call it a day, have fun. Um, they want to be as creative writing the challenges as you are in solving them. So, you know, you need a little bit of thinking outside the box. You need to be curious. I mean, you're going to do a CTF, and, you know, no matter what kinds of problems there are, which is a topic I will get into in a bit. It's probably going to have some stuff that you don't know, or it's probably going to have some concepts that maybe you've seen before, but they're being applied in a way that you haven't seen, or they're being combined with other concepts that you may not know as well. Again, capture the flag is often not so much a question of real-world vulnerabilities that you'll see you know, day to day in your job as it is a puzzle game a lot of the times. And persistence. I, I don't know how many capture the flag problems that I've just looked at. I don't know how to solve it. I try. I go back to it. I don't know how to solve it. And when I started doing capture the flag, I would get frustrated really easily. And you know, even now that I've been doing capture the flags for a couple of years, is it that I get frustrated? Sure, I get frustrated all the time. And I think anyone who does capture the flag is inevitably going to get frustrated, but it's a question of what are you going to do with it? Are you just going to, you know, set it aside, screw it, I'm not doing this capture the flag anymore, I haven't solved anything? No, because that's no fun and you're really not going to learn a whole lot if you give up after five minutes on a problem that you don't know. But if you keep whacking your head against it and trying to solve the problem, then maybe you'll solve it, and even if you don't solve it, you're probably going to learn a lot during the course of the research that you do. Now, one thing I've heard so many times when I've talked to people about Capture the Flag, and one thing that I'm sure I said plenty of times when I was thinking about starting doing them, you know, years ago, I'm not good enough for Capture the Flag. You know, Capture the Flag is for those people who, you know, beat hackers, blah, blah, blah. No, that's not required at all. The first Capture the Flag I ever did was, it was back in 2009. Um, they don't do it quite in that same form anymore, but ShmooCon used to have a contest called Hack or Halo. And it's exactly what it sounds like. There was a hacking competition that lasted maybe two or three hours, so it was a pretty short CTF. And a Halo competition, and you got points for hacking and you got points for playing Halo. And at that point, I wasn't working in InfoSec. I wasn't working in IT. In fact, I was a, law I was a lawyer at Douchebag and Douchebag LLP not doing tech anything. But I was playing around with computers in my spare time and starting to realize that I liked that a lot more than I liked slinging law books around. And I decided, hey, the CTF is only a couple of hours, why not? And so, I mean, I gave it a shot. And I was so, I was so embarrassed about my lack of skill that I didn't look for teammates. 
I even anyone who suggested it's like, no, you don't want to be on a team with me. I want to do I, I want to do this alone. I suck. I promise. All I'm going to do is drag you down. I solved a couple of the challenges, you know, a couple of the easier computer challenges, got a couple of the lock picking challenges because some of the on site CTFs have physical challenges lock pick. And that was something that even then I was reasonably good at. But, you know, I'm not sure that I got as much out of that or other CTFs that I've done later without teammates. But I feel like I still got a lot out of it. And I mean, like I said, I. I think I had first picked up a Linux box less than a year before doing that CTF. So you don't need to be elite. You don't need to have been around forever. You, it's a, it's a good way to start because you know it, throw, it throws you into the fire. You start picking up things. You start figuring out, okay, this is what I need to learn. Now, what kinds of CTFs are there? What can you expect to see in a CTF? There are mainly two kinds of CTFs that are out there. There's one called Jeopardy style and one called classic style. Jeopardy style is referred to as Jeopardy because you know there's usually kind of a board laid out and challenges in various topics with different point ratings, you know, 100 to 500, 1 to 10, that sort of thing. Um, and they're discrete puzzles. Sometimes they build on each other, but not usually. And you know, the 100, 200 level are usually considered easier. The 400, 500 are usually considered harder. Sometimes it varies, sometimes it depends on what you know. You know, there have been CTFs where the 100 level problem was killing me, but maybe I got the 200 or 300 straight out because it just so happened to mesh with how I thought. You know, if one problem is driving you crazy, the nice thing about the Jeopardy style is you can, you know, hop to another and go back to it because there's a lot of you know, di different stuff, different ideas that you're going to see, different problems to do. The classic style is real-time attack and defense. You know, you have a machine up on a local area network or VPN, and not only do you have to, you know, defend that machine, find what's wrong with it, patch it, keep those services up, but then you also have to go out and, you know, hack on the other team's machines. Um, I've done a lot more Jeopardy-style CTFs than I've done classic-style CTFs. In fact, the first classic-style CTF I did was the RUCTFE, which is, um, there's a group in Russia that does CTFs for mainly Russian universities, and that's what the RUCTF is. RUCTFE is the extended version of that. Basically, anyone in the world can get together a team, and as long as you can you know, get together and get on that VPN and play the game, it's a lot of fun. It usually falls around Thanksgiving. I actually was here in the Detroit area and did it with the MySec team last year. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I mean, we had, we were split into different parts of the team. We had people who focused on defense. We had people who focused on writing attacks, writing patches, on, you know, operations. It was, it was a real undertaking. And it was neat to see just how different it is to organize a team for Jeopardy versus organizing a classic style team. Like Jeopardy can be a lot more ad hoc, you know, okay, who's online, who wants to do the reverse engineering problem, who wants to work on web app problems, et cetera. Whereas, I mean, the classic style, you've really got to have your stuff together because you need people patching services, you need people you know, attacking services and capturing flags because usually the score is based on some combination of that. And now that kind of goes into what sorts of problems you can expect to see on the CTF. Basically, if there's any sort of skill, discipline, study, that relates to security, you're probably going to see it somewhere on a CTF. You're not going to necessarily see everything on every single CTF, but crypto, exploit writing, forensics, programming, reversing, trivia, web applications. It's not even a complete list, but these are kind of the, the things that I feel like I see the most when I'm doing CTFs or practicing CTF style problems. But it's literally anything. Um, which is nice because if you feel like honing a skill that you already have, you'll find something in a CTF to do that. If you feel like learning a skill, I mean like crypto for example, I, I really need to get better at crypto. Like I can recognize a base 64, I can recognize an MD5, but that's really about it. I definitely can't go deep in depth and tell you, you know, how 
RSA works, for example. And, you know, there are problems that require you to be able to know all of the math behind it. And through CTFs, I've realized, okay, this is something that I need to get better at. Now, what kinds of tools are you going to use? First of all, operating system environments. It's really nice to have, you know, I've got a Linux environment as well as a couple of Windows environments that I use for hacking on CTFs. You know, I've got a backtrack box. I really need to update it to Kaylee one of these days, but I haven't quite done it yet because I just, I don't know, I've made so many customizations to that old backtrack 5 R3 box that it's going to be so sad to let it go. Um, and then I have Windows because even though I don't really prefer to hack in Windows, I mean, if you've got a .NET reversing problem, it's going to be a lot easier to toss it in a decompiler on a Windows box that can deal with it natively than to mess around with it in a Linux box. And a lot of times, time is of the essence. You know, that example of the Shmukon CTF that only lasted two or three hours is a little extreme, but most CTFs tend to last two or three days. Um, scripting languages. It's really helpful to know how to code at least a little bit. You don't have to be the best programmer on the face of the earth. My goodness, I'm not. But, you know, if there's something that you see and it's like, oh, you know, I can script my way out of a jam. Like, it doesn't matter what it is. Like, learn Python, learn Perl, learn Ruby, learn Bash, learn PowerShell. Like, it doesn't matter what. It just matters that, you know, you need to be able to script at least a little bit, you know, enough to possibly talk to a network socket, enough to, you know, automate going through. Like, I, there was one crypto problem I remember doing where I was just basically like, I knew it was going to be one of like a thousand or ten thousand things, and by God, I wasn't doing that by hand. So it's really helpful, and, you know, it definitely gets you better because it gives you more situations for applying your scripting skills. And then, you know, security utilities, just basic command line, basic command line utilities, um, intercepting proxies, the stuff that you would use day to day in like manual security testing. You know, you may see that in a CTF. One thing you're not going to see is scanners. Like, I'm not going to use like Nessus or Metasploit or anything like that in a CTF. You know, that's not to knock on those tools, because you know when you're when you're doing a pen test, they're very helpful. But you know the point of a CTF is usually not to scan a network and find known vulnerabilities. Again, it goes back to the fact that these CTF organizers are completely devious. They're writing these weirdo challenges, and you know there's not going to be an existing Metasploit module for you know reverse engineering 400. For the CTF. Now remember what I said earlier about the fact that in my first CTF I was so nervous that I was such a noob that I wouldn't get together with a team? That was ridiculous and that's in fact the stupidest thing I've ever done when it comes to a CTF. Like don't be me, don't be that guy. Um, get together with a team. It doesn't matter if it's some of your coworkers, some of your friends, you know, some people that you hang out with on IRC. Um, I finally ended up getting together. I started doing CTFs with MySec sometime last year, and it's made a world of difference. It's made me a better CTF player, not only because I've picked up new skills in continuing to do CTFs, and I'm more motivated to do more CTFs because I have friends to do it with, but when you're trying to solve a problem, you'll go down this rabbit hole, and sometimes that's the right way to solve it, and sometimes it's not really going to get you anywhere. And it's nice to step back and just be able to talk to somebody and say, hey, you know, this is what I've done on this so far. It doesn't seem to be getting me anywhere. Do you have any other ideas? And, you know, the vast majority of flags that I've captured, it's been at it's been in significant part because of bouncing ideas off of other people. Um, it's nice to have a group of people with different outlooks to craft a creative way to solve these problems. So yeah, I just wanted to thank, I wanted to thank all of you in MySec for being awesome and for being fun to capture the flag with and 
Seriously, if you're nervous to join a team, don't. If you know somebody who CTFs, talk to them. If you don't know anyone who CTFs, um, ask around, ask Twitter, ask IRC, or ask your friends who don't CTF but may like to program or play around with security, because it'll be fun. Now, kind of feeding into that, the whole thinking outside the box, thinking around the problems, you do go down these rabbit holes. And I've gotten frustrated sometimes, and I've written you know, potential solutions. I'm just not taking any notes about them, and sometimes deleted them. And that's a really bad thing to do. Um, it's happened that you know there, there was a CTF I was working on. It was the um, it was the Ghost in the Shell Code teaser, and I was um, I think it was the crypto problem I believe. And early that morning, I was you know trying to think of the t trying to think of okay what to do. They seem to be suggesting like cryptographic hashes and poems, and I don't know what in the world they're talking about. But maybe there's some cryptographic hash in a poem or described by a poem or something but I thought that was completely stupid and I didn't write that down and I forgot about it and I went down some other rabbit hole for some other problem and then several hours later after thinking about it again and you know ta talking to Jeremy I believe <laughs> um, I'm like oh my god it is a poem, and sure enough, I end up finding this court document where Apple used this haiku, which was, which was not even well formed, which drives me nuts because I don't know, I'm a little bit of a poetry nerd. But you know, there was in fact a poem being used as a b being used as a key, and I had to just you know change my Google terms just a little bit. But I think if I had written that down, it might not have quite taken me so much time to think. Oh wait that's how it's to be done. So no matter how ridiculous the potential solution you think up, just leave it there, write it down, bounce it off of somebody else. It's a lot better than just discarding it offhand and not talking to anybody about it. Now, write-ups. Write-ups are a topic near and dear to my heart because, you know, a lot of times you won't solve all the problems. Sometimes you'll play a CTF, and even though you're with a team, none of you will solve any of the problems. And it's okay. It's not, you know, it's not like it's the end of the world if you don't capture any flags that weekend. But, you know, you're going to wonder how were they solved. And, you know, write-ups are, write-ups are great. A lot of teams will, you know, teams or just individuals will post stuff on their blog. We'll link it off of CTF time. We'll link it off of Forgotten Sex Wiki. And, you know, read them, enjoy them, work through them, because you're not really going to internalize it if you're just reading it. That was a mistake I made at first. I read these write-ups without actually trying to work through them, and it just didn't stick. And, you know, in addition to reading them and working through them, if you've worked on a CTF and you've solved a problem, please make a write-up. Like, Use your notes that you take during the CTF. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to take you forever. But po post it in a blog. Post it in a wiki. Post it somewhere. Even if some other people have written write-ups, you may have solved it differently than another team. I mean, I've seen problems, and four or five different teams will have solved it four or five different ways. And people who are reading have so much to learn from seeing the different ways people solve it. So if you're going to compete in CTFs, writing up problems is a great way to contribute back to the CTF community and back to the hacker community. Why do I have two copies of that slide? That's a little silly. So now you're asking yourself, okay, you know, there's all this stuff I can learn. It's a lot of fun to play with a team. How do I get involved? How do I actually start doing capture the flag competitions? Um, you know, first of all, ctftime.org is great because it has a schedule of upcoming CTF competitions. And, you know, some of them are at conferences, but a lot of them are online. And, you know, if you're like me, I don't play a lot of CTFs at cons. Um, I like running around, I like being social, I like talking to people that I only see at cons, and that's a lot of what I get out of coming to events. 
I'm not really one to, you know, sit over my computer and play a CTF all weekend when there are all these people who I never see. But, you know, if I'm at home that weekend, then yeah, it's a great time to be sitting over my computer and talking to everybody on IRC and let's solve these problems and let's capture these flags. Fortunately, a lot of CTFs nowadays are remotely accessible, so it's really easy to do that. And a lot of these are listed on ctftime.org. CTF Time is also a great source for write-ups. Another site that I really like is the Forgotten Sec CTF Wiki, and that has a selection of write-ups. It has a list of conferences and other events that frequently put on CTFs, so you can look to see if there's one coming up. Um, you know, it doesn't have specific dates usually like CTF time does, but it usually does have kind of the time of year. It's like these are the ones that do it in April, May, June, etc. Another really nice thing that's, that Forgotten Sec has is a lot of links to practice problems and, you know, practice virtual machines. Because even if there's not a live competition going on, there's still a lot of resources for problems that will help you build skills to apply in CTFs. Um, you know, some of my favorites include um, you know, Smash the Stack has a lot of good problems. Um, if you want to play around with web applications, the OWASP Vulnerable Web Applications Virtual Machine is amazing. It's got everything from, you know, WebGoat, which is basically, I don't know what web vulnerabilities are, and it walks you through from, you know, square one all the way up to more realistic style web applications to try to hack into. Um, another one is Exploit Exercises. It's a couple of vulnerable VMs to hack around in. Um, there's, there's a long list. I'm not going to bore you with the list, but both on Forgotten CTF and also captf.com slash practice CTF. Those are lists of a lot of good online um, you know, some of, some of them are contests with scoreboards, and some of them are just like, okay, here's a bunch of problems. Let's see, you know, how you can rise through the ranks, get through the harder ones. And it's nice because there's stuff available for any and every skill level. Now, um, I'm just going to touch on a few <laughs> bugs, if you will. Excessive noise, I think I just did touch on. Um, if there's, you know, too much else going on at a conference or some weekend where there's a CTF, it's okay to skip and do the next one. You know, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be the everything in your life. I mean, that's another, go, going back to the whole, you know, I'm, I'm not elite enough for CTF, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm not obsessed with doing these all the time. That's fine. You're still going to get something out of it, even if it's one of many hobbies that you have. Um, session timeout. Just don't, keep working on it. Don't, you know, Try it for five minutes, say, oh, I can't do this, and go away. Like, put the time in, put the thought in, put the research in, and you're going to learn something. And tunnel vision, that's one of the big problems that I have. Like, I'll have this one idea of how to solve the problem, and it gets to be so hard to break out of that one box. Um, and I know, I, I know it's hard. I can't just say, don't do that, because, you know, easier said than done, right? But I think that's a huge part of the value of having teammates because different people will look at it different ways. And, you know, even if everybody has their own little tunnel vision, their own one way of looking at it, five different ways you start discussing, it's a lot easier to break out that way. Um, that's pretty much all I have. I've got a few minutes left for questions. So does anybody have any questions about CTF, what you can get out of it, how to get involved, anything? Thanks for asking. <laughs> the CTF is actually starting as soon as this talk finishes. It's in the waterfront room. Um, the organizers are in there. They will be able to get you started and get you going. Um, there was a joint CTF between B-Sides Chicago and B-Sides Detroit. But even if you did not participate at B-Sides Chicago or in any of the challenges between B-Sides Chicago and B-Sides Detroit, there is still a Besides Detroit specific leaderboard, there's still you know, a chance for you to win prizes, accolades, hugs from your friends, um, and still a chance for you to learn a lot. It's going to be going on starting now, really, until the end of the conference. Does anybody have any other questions?
sounds like no. So thank you all so much for coming. Oh, oh, sorry, you're folding your shirt. I thought there, I thought there was a hand up. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, if you have a chance, please do go to the waterfront room and you know check out the CTF, hack all the things, meet some new friends, and I'll see you all around the con.